So just to continue with what he was saying, exactly, don't go unless you're called, because <laughs> that it, it really is a, a calling. And I remember as we were preparing, uh, our families, especially our parents, were so <laughs> yes, sorry, <laughs> our parents were so upset. Um, and my mom was actually mad at me for like the the year before we left, and. Every time I tried talking to her, she was just so hurt and angry. You know, how could you leave us? How could you leave your family, your grandkids? And, and so one day I called her and asked her out for lunch. And I, I said, Mom, we are called by the Lord God Almighty. Who am I to say no to him? And what would become of me if I did? And that was all it took. Right then she knew that we, you know, we were in the will of God. We had to go. And so... We did, and so here we are now. And so he's got a, a short message, and we've got some beautiful pictures that show you life and love in Honduras. But I just want to say to you, as a church family, we love you. We feel like we are part of your family. We don't come very often, but we feel like we belong here. Like Pastor said, we, we came once with Dr. Leon, and we just never stopped coming. So, um, But I just want to say, you know, talking about how much God loves us, when you guys sow into our ministry, it shows that you love our kids. We have 15 kids that we're responsible for at Promise Home now, and they are precious. 13 of them actually belong to Promise Home, but we have a new model now, which is house parents. We have a boy's house and a girl's house, and both houses have parents in them, which is really wonderful. And we're showing them what the family atmosphere looks like and how a family operates so that when they grow up, they can have healthy families of their own. And so two, one set of the house parents has two of their own kids that Promise Home now has taken responsibility for because they, they work with us. But um, anyway, um, these kids, our Promise Home kids don't have parents. They don't have families to love them and guide them and care for them and protect them, make them feel safe and nurtured. And um, you guys help us do that. We couldn't do it without you. So we just want to say thank you very much. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Debbie. Um, you're such a blessing to us. I'll let him finish now. So when we took over at Promise Home, they've always had a model of, em of employees. They had ladies that took care of the kids, and they had employees for this and employees for that. And we recognized that it was not really seen as a ministry. It was seen as an employment opportunity. So they always treated it as a job. So one of the first things we did was we started to change that model. So our house parents aren't actually employees. They're missionaries. Yes. They're Honduran missionaries, but they are missionaries. They're treated like missionaries, and they're our peers. We, we have stewardship over the ministry, but they're our peers as far as being missionaries. And it's just changed the whole dynamic of the ministry, just Changing the thinking from, oh, Promise Home is an employer to now I'm serving at Promise Home as a, as a missionary. I um, work for God. That's, that's what yes. they, they love knowing, that they're not working for us. They are working for, for God, and that's substantial for them. Yeah. Tonight, we're doing things a little bit different because you guys are family, so we're just kind of treating it. Yeah. Yeah. Fun. Yes. So what we did is... We downloaded a bunch of pictures today, and we're just going to go through the pictures and just share some of the things that have gone on over the last year. We'll just start popping some pictures up, and we'll start explaining as we go what is going on at Promise Home. Do you want to participate, too? Okay. These are pilas. This is something we've been doing for years, and... If you, if you really took it on the shape of it, it's a key. These things are keys to get us into communities. They get, they're keys to get us into homes. And, to, and what this is, it's an outdoor sink. It stores water. They do their laundry. They do their food preparation. They do their bathing at the, this outdoor sink. And we usually do these with teams. And this team is down. Uh, they so were down maybe in June. This is where the water is. And then here and here, there's a washboard where they literally hand wash their clothes and they bathe and they um, 
prepare their food. So they prepare yeah. their food on one side and wash their clothes and bathe on the other side. Yeah. The, the guy helping me is David. He's actually the house parent for our girls. He's <coughs> bilingual. He is amazingly gifted as a worship leader. You put an instrument in his hands, he's going to start playing it. He, so he's, he's actually started to teach our, our kids to play piano, play guitar. Um, <laughs> just amazing man of God. Where does the water come from? The water is usually brought in from the river. What they'll do is connect a, a bigger line to the river, and it gravity feeds into communities. And then people just stub into those water lines and will run it to their pilas. And they don't worry about wasting water because it's just coming right off the river, and they'll flow it into the pila. And from where it goes from there, they don't care. Uh, but it's not drinkable water. It's good for bathing, but not for drinking. Do I pop up they another? Can live with it because they, they boil. They, they, they yeah. Boil the water. Yeah. Uh, oftentimes, if they can't afford drinking water, they'll catch rainwater as well. We had a family that joined us this summer, and they did a VBS with our kids. Amazing. Full scale VBS. They brought in all the props, they brought in toys, they brought in for puppet shows, and the kids had a great, great time, and they even brought in stuff to where the kids earned tokens through the week, right? And then they had almost like a shop at the end where the kids could go in and buy toys with their tokens for memorizing scripture or for participation, and it was just a great time. Pop up another one. This is us out with... Um, that was with Mike and Carrie Pruitt's team. They were doing an exploratory team like in May. And this church is from the Oklahoma area. And they have, I don't know how many campuses. And they're going to start partnering with Promise Home. And they've got three teams scheduled already next year. But just with Sandra and I, and there were four of them, I don't know how many healings and salvations we saw just in a three-day time period. This was one of the guys we were ministering to, and you'll see a few more along the way. He's crippled now. Yeah. He had um, either got shot or had an accident. We believe that he was a gang member. They didn't tell us that. But um, anyway, so we were trying to, um, we preached the gospel to him, but he unfortunately did not accept, did not Jesus, accept. that day. This is one of the houses where we visited when we were out. Many of the houses looked like this. When we're out doing ministry, if you guys ever come down <laughs> faster, this is what you will be seeing. We don't stay on campus. When we have teams, we get out, put your feet in the dirt out in the communities, and you're going to be sharing the gospel. You're going to be praying for healings and seeing healings. You're going to be praying for deliverances and seeing deliverances. When we go out, we have an expectation that's going to happen. Heaven will invade earth when our feet hit the ground and we go out doing what God is calling us to do. This is another, uh, we just saw a couple guys on the road. They were waiting for a bus, so we pulled over and jumped out of the truck and started sharing the gospel with them. Um, it was just us out doing ministry. This is when... Um the Radiant team, you guys uh, partner with Radiant Church sometimes. Um, they came down last um, at June, and they helped us plant corn. They were planting corn. You guys in, know in Pastor picture. Jen, right? That's Pastor Jen up in the green shirt. She decided that she was going to go plant corn because she's a farmer's daughter. So she's going to get our corn going for us. And the next thing I know, half the kids are down assisting in the corn planting. Okay, so was it last week? Maybe last week. We got chickens back in May. We, we, we're, we're moving towards trying to have our own garden and have our own chickens, and we want to get a cow. So last week, Selbin, one of our house parents, sends me a picture. We got our first five eggs. I said, okay, Selbin, what you need to do, that's our first fruits. So those five eggs, you need to find somebody to give those five eggs to. And they got some rice and beans and some other things. So he took the boys out. And the boys 
we're out ministering. We're teaching our kids to be missionaries, and which is so funny. We took the kids out earlier this year, and we went out doing some ministry, and they'll share the gospel. They'll sing. They'll pray. They'll take food. And on our way back up the hill, we're walking up, and she said, uh, Grace goes, Daddy? I said, yes, Grace. She said, being a missionary is hard work. <laughs> I said, yes, sweetheart, it is very hard work. This is one of the families we minister to. They have, uh, I should say, Odina has six young kids. Her husband was assassinated about a year and a half ago. So she's a widow, and God tells us to take care of widows and orphans. We're taking care of orphans. We also take care of widows. And we, we, uh, are, we get them food when... And we take them clothing, we take them toys, and we just visit them and minister to them. About every six weeks, we take a large bag of rice and beans, cereal, milk, chicken, um, oil, salt, sugar um, to them and, and supplement whatever, um, whatever they need. Because she's 27 years old with six little kids and finding you know a provider, that's going to be difficult for her. So... We will be continually taking care of that family. Next picture. Okay, this guy was deaf in his left ear. That's Pastor Saul laying hands on him. I've been working with Pastor Saul for a very long 2006. time. 2006, okay. And the guy could not hear out of his left ear. But when we left, he could hear out of his left ear. So. <laughs> All right, next picture. All right, I'm trying to think of where we were ministry. here. It's just, just pictures. Some of these are just pictures of ministry that, you know, on, on the same trip. Yeah, the lady at the top is Pastora Reina. That is Pastor Jose's wife. They, they pastor the church at Promise Home. Powerhouses. Yeah. I mean, powerhouses. Wow. Yeah, it, the, Pastor they are Steve. amazing. Sometime you got to come and preach in that church. They yes. would love your preaching because it, it's so anointed and powerful. Your Pastor Jose is a, a lot of passion, and you would you would love him very much. If Pastor Jose, we just ordained him this year when Pastors Mac and Jen were down, and uh, very first person we've ever ordained. And leading up to it in my prayer time, God said, spoke to me. He said, "You do realize." the first person you're ordaining as an apostle. I said, yeah, I'll take that. So he's just powerful. This is an oven. This is a Honduran oven. This is where they do their cooking. I took that. Oh, yes. They love their Pepsi. Pepsi they love and their Coke is, their, is the favorite thing there. Oh, yes. It's the good stuff, though. None of that high fructose corn syrup. It's sugar country. There are sugar cane fields everywhere, so they're not putting that fake stuff in their soda. They use real sugar. Yes. It's like when we were kids. We get provision from another ministry in San Pedro Sula, and this is just we had received a food supply, and the kids were excited and helped to unload the goods that day. Um, I just put that picture in there because our kids are cute. That's, yeah. that's really yeah. it. I just wanted you to see their cuteness. All right. Next up. That is where we live. Wow. It's tough. I mean. Somebody's got to yeah. do it, though. I mean, you know? somebody so. has to do it, but that is our home. That is our yard. It is unbelievable. I still wake up nearly every morning, walk out, and shake my head and just cannot believe where God has placed us. It is just incredibly beautiful. Yeah, we yes. cut the top off of a mountain and, and built the ministry. This is the, gir the, the girl's house, the boy's house, our kitchen and dining room. We have on-site missionary housing. That's new also, Pastor. So if you guys come, or when you come, you'll be staying on Promise Home property. She's a, she's yes. a prophetess. So. I'm just saying, when, when you come, you guys will be staying actually with us, with the children on Promise Home property. And then this is our house here. This is our garden. 
and our chicken house back here, and uh, our utility area, and then our corn is over here. And all of our, we're gonna have goats and cows along this mountainside right here. Next up, I need to put up some fence. We have some groups coming, and we already have the holes all dug. We just need to start setting posts and, um, and then start moving towards some more this, livestock. This is a, a picture. This was the family that came down for the VBS. But on their free day, we were in downtown El Progreso um, shopping in the market, and they led that Honduran man to, to Christ. Wow. Yeah. They bought a hammock from him and asked him if, if, they, if he knew Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and he didn't. So right there, they preached the gospel right in the market, and he received Christ. Amen. It's another recipient of a Pila. Um, I could almost say 100% certain that she probably, probably accepted Christ because... Most often, everywhere we put in a pila. Oh, I know, I know she did. You, okay. <laughs> I, I, I'm pretty sure she actually knew Christ. Um, okay. She was so full of joy. Those are not her kids. Those are actually her grandkids. I don't know if her son or daughter left for the States or whatever, but um, those are her grandkids, and that is the pila that she received. And, and uh, there will be another photo of, a, of what she was using for water to catch water before the pila in there. Just another home where we were out doing ministry, and obviously, I don't know who was talking, but whoever it was had their attention. I just this put is, that in there. This is what you see a lot, though. You notice them listening? She's listening, too. Around the corner. I she's, put that picture in there uh, the just to show you, you know, how they live. You know, this is real life people living in a stick house with dirt floors. And actually, that's, that leads us to another ministry that we're getting ready to start. Um, we have another friend in the San Antonio area that has a ministry, and they... Of Honduras, San Antonio yeah, and Honduras. Yes, yes, San Antonio, Honduras. Um, and they put in concrete floors with, uh, with houses that have dirt floors. He said, I got tired of seeing babies crawling around in the dirt. So they started... Um, you know, having stick homes, but they would go in and lay the foundation and put concrete down so they're not crawling in dirt and bugs and everything else. Um, and they also do outhouses. And so those are two ministries that we're going to start doing in our side of the country. This is just another picture of our boys ministering when they went out to give the eggs and the rice and beans. Just this last week. More pictures of us on foot walking door to door with with the gospel. A funny story when when uh, the family was here, she had just a, a, a amazing move of God on her at the church service, and after that she turned around and brushed up against somebody. Lilia brushed up against this lady, and the lady fell out as she brushed up against. Boom. She just hit the ground. So the, the glory was on her, and as soon as it transferred, the lady went out. This is Bay Lane. Doesn't she have a beautiful smile? Bay Lane was, was autistic. And uh, if you God know any has worked a miracle in her. She's actually going to school now. And if you didn't know it, you wouldn't know that she's ever been diagnosed as being autistic. And God has just worked the healing in her. Yes. She's got the most amazing smile. That's we'll the eggs in, in Oscar's hand, his, the, the, the <laughs> right hand there on the bottom. That's the five eggs that we gave that family along with a big bag of rice and beans. Five eggs is a big deal. <laughs> For them to show up with five eggs and some rice and beans, that is a big, big deal. That's Selvin. It, the, the pictures are kind of distorted a little bit. It's um, maybe a different format or something. But yeah, Selvin is actually the house parent. For, for the boys. The house dad in the boys' house. And if you notice, Selvin's praying for the guy, and each one of the boys... They're praying, too. They got their hands up, and they're praying with him. They're engaged. They're not just 
spectators. They engage in what's going on. More pictures of VBS. Yes. You can just go on and try to. That's Sierra. She's from the, the church in Oklahoma, a powerful woman of God, just laying hands and praying for people in, in the service. Yeah. She's actually the mission director at the church that starting to partner with us from Oklahoma. The woman with the two kids, that was what they used to catch water before we gave them the pila. That's Marcos, our baby, and um, Jaden. He was the, on the mission team in July, I think. I think everybody wants to sneak Marcos home. Marcos <laughs> has the most amazing personality. He just, like, he just sticks to you, and you can't let go of him. That's Jennifer. They, they actually built, that family raised the money for and built a basketball court for our kids at Promise Home. We mix concrete the hard way. <laughs> it, we don't get ready mix. We mix it. That's Jennifer and Scott mixing co concrete. That's Jim <laughs> preaching with our translator, one of our translators, Willie. Altar call, a very powerful altar call. Yeah. It was funny because Mike is back behind me. He said, I've never caught people before. I said, just catch them, Mike. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is door-to-door -door evangelism and prayer and provision with rice and beans. We always make sure that the, the kids are, if they're old enough to understand that the kids are saved, but if they're too young, we always bless the children. We always lay hands on them and bless them like Jesus would. That's just life and love in Honduras right there. <laughs> He's a board member of Promise Home and um, just loving on the kids is what they need. Yeah. We had a team in June also that brought baseball gloves and brought and came down and played baseball with our kids. Yeah. We have a lot of baseball equipment now. This is just one of our teams. This is the Radiant Church group and just out giving out rice and beans. And the natives carry the stuff around on their heads, so they decided, oh, we're going to carry the food around on our heads too. I sucked that one in there so you actually, guys can she, see how funny it is. She is Honduran. She lives in the U.S., but she's actually Honduran. Yes. I sucked that in there so you can see how fun it is on a mission trip. <laughs> that, is, that is a sunset, I believe. Yeah. It's horrible. It's a sacrifice. <laughs> More fun just out. Yeah, just people out having fun, sharing the gospel. That's how we got around in the back of the pickup. It was raining that day, so it looks kind of wet. and It's always wet. It rains often. Are there any more photos, or is that it? That's all of them. Okay. So God is definitely on the move in Honduras. I, I know I've been here before, and I've said before, we, we see so many salvations, I quit keeping count. Uh, part of it was I felt convicted about it. I'm like, why am I keeping count? They're not mine to count. They're his. So he knows the number. I don't really need to know the number. I'm just the harvester, and, and he'll keep an accurate count. So... Um, but, yes, we, we just see salvations and salvations. One of my fun stories that's happened this last year, I was in some, I should back up a little bit. There was a lady that worked for us that was a cook, and she started having health issues around December last year, right? And uh, she just is having one health issue after another after another. And um, then I'm in prayer one morning and I'm praying for her and God starts to reveal some stuff. There's a lot of witchcraft where we're at, a lot. And um, he starts revealing to me and showing me pictures and, and that she's being cursed. So I went and met with her and I said, okay, after lunch today, I need you to come over to the house and Sandra and I need to talk to you a little bit because God's told me she's been cursed and that's why she's having these health issues. She comes to the house 
And she no more than walks through the front door and she starts talking about this witch that is cursing her. I'm like, well, it just so happens that God spoke to me about this this morning. And she, uh, <laughs> she was delivered all over our living room rug. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you've ever been in a deliverance before, but it's oftentimes people start vomiting. And, uh, and so there's a stain on the rug. And I, Sanders like, you need to clean that stain up. I said, no, I want to leave it there so I can remember the deliverance. She said, I don't want a Satan stain on my rug in the living room. <laughs> Just funny stories. But um, we had another guy. There's a community just up the road from us, and uh, it's just so much witchcraft. We had a guy that we got word of that had had just gone like comatose. Young man. He's 21, 22, and had been in bed for months. And they went in, did a sonogram, and found the cyst in his stomach. So they went in and did surgery to remove the cyst. And it was a living creature inside of him. Living creature inside of him. And uh, they took it out, but he was still comatose for quite a while. And we made a couple visits to his house and prayed for him and didn't see anything happening. And then his father wouldn't let us back to pray anymore. And we're certain it's because whoever it was that was doing it probably threatened him. But then we got word about three weeks ago he's been delivered. He's up. He's walking around. And, and that happened after the Radiant Church came down, we went into that community with guns blazing. And uh, we saw a lot of salvations down in that area. And um, just. And they were casting out the witchcraft. Yeah. And then the next thing you know, we got a, a word that he was delivered. Yeah. That the father wouldn't let anybody go in to, and see him. So we just believe that it's when. Like, yeah. And yeah. They were so. So it, it is real. I don't know if you guys believe that it's real, but it is real. We deal with it all the time. No, I don't want to scare you because it's just it's just Satan. It's just Satan. I mean, it's nothing. It's easy. Yeah. It's just but um, you have the power. He's he's here too. I mean, he works everywhere. You just you you can't become numb to it in the environment you're in. That's what we've learned. When you're in that environment, you become numb to it because it's what you're around it every day. But then when you take off and you go to Brazil, you'll it's like, ooh, there's what is this? Because you're not accustomed to that territorial reign. And but he's here. But you have the power. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Yeah, just understand your authority. I could teach all night on authority. But um, yes, I don't ever get scared of what he might do. It's easy, easy for God. Yeah, yeah. he's the boss. <laughs> so, um, I have just a little short message. Um, this morning I was in my prayer time and God just started talking to me about prayer of all things. You know, I was in my prayer time. I was laying on the couch praying in tongues and uh, he just started showing me some different things I thought was interesting. So I'm just sharing it with you tonight. Not so much a, a message as just, I would call it more of a devotion. So how many of us are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit? You've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Okay. How many of you have a prayer language? How many of you pray in your prayer language more than 15 minutes a day? The power is in your prayer language. I remember Sandra and I were out running around one day, just running errands, and Sandra said, you know, I notice when we're praying in our prayer language, there's so much power in it. It's just things are different. When The more I pray in my prayer language, the, the more power there is in my life. And she said, why do you think that is? And it's just out of my mouth. I said, oh, it's because we give voice to the Holy Spirit. Where did that come from? If you can think about 
you're in a situation, you're in a room, and everybody's talking all the time, and you just have to sit quietly in the corner. You're not allowed to even open your mouth and speak because that might scare somebody. Don't say anything. You might scare somebody. Don't say anything. They might be weirded out by what you have to say. So the Holy Spirit's just bound up in us all the time. He has so much voice for us in our lives. He has the power to change things in our lives, but we just silence him. My my talk with God this morning, I'm just sharing with you. So Sandra, a few years ago, had a dream, and she was caught up into heaven. And when she, she said, the thing I remember most when I was in heaven was God was like a magnet. He, had, he was like a love magnet, just drawing me in. You couldn't help. You are just being drawn into him. And, you, you, and w- like when you put two magnets together... They're like really difficult to pull apart. You ever try to pull two magnets apart that are stuck? And that's what it's like with God All right. when you're really there. So she said it was just magnetic. And he started talking to me this morning about prayer time, my prayer in, um, in my, my prayer language. And he said, when you're praying like that, It actually starts putting things in alignment. And it's been a long time since I've been in school. But what I remember about magnets, you can take something and magnetize it. Like take a screwdriver and you can rub a magnet on it. Or you can rub a magnet on a nail and it'll magnetize it. Because what you're doing, if I remember correctly, is you start setting the electrons in alignment. Positive, negative, positive, negative. So all the positives are going one direction and all the negatives are going to one direction. And uh, he said, so when you start praying, you start compassing yourself towards heaven. You start compassing yourself towards heaven. And then today I was Googling, just trying to figure out and understand magnets. And what magnets do, they're a circular energy. So... You go negative, positive, back out negative, positive. It's a circular energy. And if you think about God and how God works, God goes to the Holy Spirit through us, Jesus the Father. Father, Holy Spirit to us, Jesus the Father. Right? Right? It's a circular energy. Isn't it interesting that God created the earth with a North Pole and a South Pole and a circular energy? And then... The more we pray, the more we compass ourselves north towards him. Just something to ponder, to think on a little bit. (laughs) The more we spend time with God, the more it puts things in the correct alignment. If you take an item and you magnetize it, It'll be magnetic for a while, but unless it's created that way, it'll eventually lose its magnetism because it's not aligned. Things, the, the electrons start getting scattered again, and we don't, our compass is going this way, it's going that way, it's going that way, and you got to start aligning those electrons again, pointing ourselves back towards heaven. I believe that there's power in our prayers. But I think there's so much more power when you're using your prayer language. Because then you're getting directly the Father through the Holy Spirit right back out to Jesus. Jesus goes to our Father through the Holy Spirit. And we're just part of that circular motion. Constantly aligning ourselves within that circular power force. If you, if you take and think about yourselves, oh, let's see here. There it is. You guys have done this before. Probably remember this from school. I can take a nail, and it has no power. 
right? It's just a nail. But what happens when I connect it to the power force? Unseen power, where does this power come from? It's connected to the power force. It's connected to the source. You remove this from the power source, and it has no power. It's not magically picking those things up. It's connected to the source. You want the power, you've got to connect yourself. Put yourself in alignment with the one that is the power. Here's what's also really cool about magnets. If you think about God, you think about the magnet. The things that are supposed to work with him connect. But what's really cool, when you're in alignment with God and something's coming along that doesn't belong, no matter how hard I try, I can't get these two things to go together. He begins to repel, pushing away those things that don't belong. He's drawing when I need to draw, and he's repelling when he needs to repel. We've got to learn to connect to the power source. I was reading in Mark recently, and just something stood out that I had never really picked up on before. It said in um, Mark chapter 6, verse 30, 31, he says, the apostles returned to Jesus from their ministry tour, and he told them they had done what they had taught. Then Jesus said, let's get away from the crowds for a while and rest. There were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. They left by boat for a quieter spot. But many people saw them leaving, and people from many towns ran ahead along the shore, met them as they landed. A vast crowd was there as he stepped from the boat, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he taught them many things. Jesus and the apostles, they're ministering and ministering and ministering. And they said, okay, Jesus said, okay, we've got to get a, some quiet time. And what did you, Jesus do in his quiet time? He prayed. He got before the Father. But yet ministry was chasing him down. And I know this because Sandra and I, this is a struggle. You get so involved in ministry that you don't get that time in your solitude, your quiet time with God. And if you go on in this story, they go on and they, they feed the masses, right? But then Jesus said, you guys get in the boat and go across the lake. And Jesus went off into his quiet time. I think what Jesus knew is that the people were following the boat. He thought, if I put these guys on the boat and send them across the lake, maybe they'll follow them to the other side of the lake and I can sneak off. And get some quiet time. I was also reading Matthew, Mark, Luke. They all, if you notice the, the Gospels, they usually have a different twist. One will say things one way. And does, but there's a, the story where Jesus is baptized. And they all recount it the same way. Little differences. But they, they all talk about him being baptized the Holy Spirit comes down like a dove. And then the next thing you know, it says, and then the Holy Spirit prompted him to go into the wilderness. It's like as soon as the Holy Spirit came upon him, he knew I need my solitude. And in, in my thinking, because I just like to process things different, and I dream a little, I'm thinking, Okay, he just received the Holy Spirit. Did he get a prayer language? Because he always went away from the disciples when he was praying. Maybe he was praying in his prayer language. I don't know. Maybe he went out into the desert 
and he was really tapping into his prayer language. I like to think that he was. Maybe he wasn't, but I like to think that maybe he was. And that time in the desert after he received the Holy Spirit was a time where he was really beginning to connect and prepare himself for the ministry ahead. He was preparing in the solitude, in the quiet, in the wilderness, connecting, praying. (laughs) It's easy to allow ministry, to allow life to interrupt us and get us away from our, our prayer time. It's so easy. I think that Satan doesn't like it when we sing and worship but I know he doesn't like it when we pray. He, he, he knows when we're singing to God, he'll just plug his ears for a little while. But when we start praying, the atmosphere starts changing around us. Right? The atmosphere starts changing. The battles are being won. The strongholds are coming down. In Acts 2, (laughs) we all love Acts chapter 2, right? That's We're Pentecostal. We're charismatic. We love Acts chapter 2. On the day day of Pentecost, seven weeks after Jesus' resurrection, the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm in the skies above them, and it filled the house where they were meeting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them his ability, this ability. I'm reading out of the NLT. I like New King James where it says they were all in one accord. I don't think that they were having a church potluck. Right? I, I think it's so interesting if if you say we're having a church potluck, the place is packed. Can't find a parking space in the parking lot. You say we're having a prayer meeting and right? Sorry, I don't mean to step on toes, but but they were in a one accord. What were they doing? I think that they were singing, but most importantly, I think that they were praying. I think that they were all praying. I think the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began to speak in other languages, but I think that they were praying in other languages. I think they're they're in the middle of praying, and the, the, the prayer language just springs out of them, and they're all praying in their prayer language. The power, the shift of the church, the power comes into them to go out and accomplish the purpose that all of us are called to. All of us. We're all missionaries. We all have a mission. All of us. Not just Sandra and me. Go off to Honduras. Everywhere you are is your mission field. If your feet are in that room, that's your mission ground. And that room is to be taken for the kingdom of heaven. It's mine now. It's mine. We're here to take back what's been stolen. When you understand that everything was ours at one time. All belong to God. And out of a foolish decision, Adam handed his keys over to Satan. But we have the keys back. The keys are ours. Right? So you have to go in and just take it. It, You just have to take it. Fight's already been fought. So... It is your mission ground. I remember preparing for Honduras. I wanted to go to Honduras forever. 2002, I got the call. I had to wait 19 years before I finally got the green light. 
and God said, okay, go now. But before that, I remember I was a security guard at IDOT. And I was standing in the lobby one day, and I said, okay, Lord, until I get to go to Honduras, this is my mission ground. This is it. Anywhere I can see in this building, anybody that comes through that door is my mission ground. And recklessly, I would lead people to Christ at the front desk. I would pray for healings at the front desk. And others would fear being fired, right? You can't do that. You're a state employee. So God's my source. This is just a resource. And so if I get fired because I'm doing the will of God, then he'll just provide me with something else. Now, you've got to make that decision for yourself. Disclaimer. (laughs) I'm a faith walker, so... I I just believe that God is going to provide for me no matter where we are, what we're doing. He put me in that job. He'll move me on to another one, right? So, yes, we saw salvations at the front desk. People would come in, and next thing you know, I'm talking Jesus. But it can be the same for you. Your family is your mission ground. Your workplace is your mission ground. If you're a coach, it's your mission ground. Anything. Anything. It's your mission ground. We were given a great commission, not a great suggestion. Right? right? So go out and do the mission. You are a missionary. All of us. We'll go out and do the kingdom work. Impact heaven. Impact heaven. Do something eternal. If you've never led somebody to Christ, it's easy. Just tell your story. Tell your testimony. You are the walking gospel. Look what God has done in you. Look what God has done in you. All of us have an amazing testimony. Just share it. I remember Sandra one time, she said, I share the gospel all the time. I've never led anybody to Christ. And I said, well, did you ask them? No. I said, you just have to ask a question. Would you like to receive Jesus Christ into your heart? I can lead you in a prayer. And then she started seeing salvations. Left and right. You got to ask the question. Ask the question. Impact heaven. Change eternity. Change eternity. All the things you labor for in this world are going to be just dust in the wind. We work so hard for things that are dust in the wind. Work hard for the things that are eternal. All right. I'll just end on that note. <laughs> Just something that happened to me in my God time this morning. I really just felt like I needed to share it. And uh, hopefully you guys got as much out of it as I did. And uh, again, we thank you so much. What? No. <laughs> Actually, we we are blessed with very very nice accommodations. We have running water. We have hot water. Actually, we have a a, a well that makes fifty gallons a minute, and it's drinkable. So. We don't drink it, but you can drink it. It's clean. We brush our teeth with it, shower with it. We have hot water and yeah, yeah, we have. <laughs> when we first moved there, we didn't have those luxuries. We were taking bucket baths and washing our clothes on the pila. <laughs> it, yeah, yeah, we didn't have a flushing toilet, none of that. So <laughs> 
so in that culture, you know, women do all the work, all the housework. And we had a pila, and that's the only way we were able to do our laundry. And Jim was outside in the pila, you know, hand washing all of our laundry. And a woman's walking by, and she goes, you know, she's seeing a man <laughs> washing laundry at the pila. I mean, she, she didn't do a double take. She did a triple take. She couldn't believe there was a man washing laundry in the pila. It was so funny. <laughs> So, but Sandra and I have always had a call to Africa, and I think, or we, I should say, we believe that what we were living with when we first got to Honduras was just preparing us for Africa, because we are now beginning to open up to take over a children's home in Kenya. Yes, yeah, so we're taking over another children's home in Kenya, there's 18 children, and uh, just a beautiful, beautiful ministry. They, they're fantastic. So be praying for that. And we just are stepping out in faith, believing the, for the provision. And God will see us through. He, he always sees us through. <laughs> so, um, you want to come on up, Pastor, and pray us out? What do you want to do? <laughs> Brother, you said so many good things right there, uh, but one thing that really stuck out in my mind, you said God is our source and we are his resource. Yes. How many know we are ambassadors of heaven? Amen. Brother Jim, we say this all the time here, Jesus isn't here anymore, but we are. We are. That's it. And then... Another thing that you said was so powerful, we are the walking gospel. Right, that's so good. Walking Hallelujah. gospel. I don't think I've ever heard it put that way, brother. Uh, and, and like you said, everywhere we go, it's our mission field. And for so many people, we are the only Bible they will ever read, and we are the only Jesus they will ever meet. So how many know we got our work cut out for us? So obviously, we're not all called to Honduras, but we are all called to go because that is the Great Commission, Brother Jim. But for those who are called to go, how many know we're going to support them? I said we're going to support them. We're going to support them with our prayers, our encouragement, and we're going to support them with our finances. Amen. We're going to ask the ushers to come tonight, and we want to receive a special love.